question becomes this morning, do you believe in this Jesus? Do I believe that Jesus was and is the Son of God? Do I believe that Jesus died on a cross and after three days arose from the dead? I am here to share with you the fact that the power that comes from resurrection, there is no power like it on this side of heaven. It is the kind of power that will give you everything you need to live a successful and powerful and God-pleasing life. Now, I understand this morning that many would have different responses to how to live your life, how to live your life with power, how to live your life with courage, how to kind of deal with life and all the curveballs that come our way. Some would say, you know, all we need is the power of positive thinking. If you can just think positively, then you're going to accomplish much in life. Others would say, you know, it's all about the physical. You need to be physically fit because the physical affects the emotional and affects the spiritual. So what you eat matters. How you exercise matters. How you live a healthy life matters. If you can just get your physical part in order, everything else will enable you to be successful. Some would say, you know what you need? You need to just get smarter. You just need to get a better education. You just need to add another degree to your list. Because as you get smarter, you're going to get more powerful, and you're going to get more able to deal with life's challenges. Others would say, it's all about networking. It's all about who you know. It's all about connecting with the right people so that you can go up the corporate ladder. And It's all about who you know. If you know the right people, you're going to be powerful. You're going to be successful. You're going to deal with life appropriately. Others would say that it's all about karma. You do good, good will come right back at you. If you do bad, you'll get bad right back at you. So you want to make sure you got a lot of good karma in your life. And they would say that with that will enable you to be successful and powerful in life. For others of you, It's all about releasing all the negative toxins out of your body. Stretch and be flexible in certain ways and get all that negative energy out of you so that you can get all the positive energy in you. And if you can do that, then you will be powerful. Then you'll be successful. Then you'll be courageous enough to deal with life's challenges. This morning, I'm not saying that any or all of those don't help. But at the end of the day, friend, there is a power that is so much greater than positive thinking. There is a power that is so much greater than any education. There is a power that is so much greater than networking with the right people. The fact of the matter is the greatest power is the resurrection power, the power that arose Jesus from the dead. And if we can tap into that power, God will enable you to have all that you need to live a powerful, courageous life. Some definitely know the story of Christmas. We've heard it many times, but unfortunately at times we don't know the Easter story. And so this morning I read to you the Easter story out of Matthew 28, 1 to 10. The words will come on the screen. Listen to these words on this Easter Sunday. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, And the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His resurrection, or his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said he would. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, worshipped him, and then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. 
go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. It's amazing, this passage, for many reasons. Just as a side note, I love the fact that Jesus first expressed and revealed his resurrection to women. And I want you to know that sometimes the Christian faith and Jesus himself gets criticized about our treatment of women. The fact of the matter is God chose women to be the first eyewitnesses of the greatest moment in his history. God values women, friends. No, the fact of the matter is Jesus predicted his resurrection, didn't he? He said that after three days he would arise from the dead. He predicted that. Now, throughout history, many people have predicted a lot of things, haven't they? A lot of people have predicted a lot of things that actually didn't happen. For instance, here are a few examples. The president of Michigan Savings Bank advising Henry Ford's lawyer not to invest in the Ford Motor Company in 1903. Why? He said this to him. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty and a fad. Hope you found a spot for your horse today. Mary Somerville, pioneer of radio educational broadcasts in 1948, said the television won't last. It's a flash in the pan. Byte Magazine editor Edmund De Jesus in 1998 said this, Y2K is a crisis without precedent in human history. You still have water in your bathtubs? You still have a canteen filled with goods? Y2K. Popular Mechanics in 1949 said this, Computers in the future may weigh no more than one and a half tons. Anybody have an iPad here today? How did you get it in here? Flatbed truck? Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer, 2007, said, There is no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share, no chance. Any iPhones in the place today? I guess our friend is wrong. Sir John Eric Erickson, British surgeon, appointed surgeon, extraordinary to Queen Victoria, the best surgeon there was. He said this, no surgeon will ever operate on the heart or the brain. The abdomen, the chest, and the brain will forever be shut from the intrusion of the wise and human surgeon was wrong, wasn't he? It's amazing what the medical world has discovered and is able to do. You see, many people have made many predictions throughout history that simply never came true. They were wrong. The reality this morning is this. Jesus clearly predicted he would rise from the dead after three days. Over and over again in the scriptures, he predicted this. We see it in Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus Christ began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Matthew 17, 22, 23 says, Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Matthew 20, 18 and 19 says, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him up to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Matthew 26, 32. But after I have been raised... I will go before you to Galilee. Friend, Jesus, these are just a few examples. Jesus over and over again predicted that he would die on a cross and after three days arise from the dead. This is historical fact. Any good historian would have to write that in the history books, that there was a man. His name was Jesus. He walked the planet. He had an amazing ministry. He died a ruthless death. And three days later, he arose from the dead. What Jesus predicted actually happened. You see, if Jesus' prediction of his resurrection never happened, everything Christianity stands for would be a farce. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, Paul says this, 
If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and if so is your faith. We would be wasting our time here this morning if Jesus never rose from the dead. The fact of the matter, he did. Now, some might say, you know what? Jesus was really never dead. He didn't really die on the cross. Yes, he was nailed, but he survived it. He survived the three floggings before the crucifixion. He survived the floggings when the Roman uh, soldiers went to take him off the cross. They didn't realize he was, he was still alive. Friends, that is so untrue. The reality is, if a prisoner that was crucified was not dead on the cross, they would break their shins and their legs so that they couldn't breathe properly anymore and make sure they were dead before they took them off. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus, they never broke his legs because it was prophesied that no bone would be broken in his body because he was already dead. And so when they took him down, they rolled him into linen, they put him in a tomb just to survive that linen experience. must have been interesting. And they put him in the tomb, and they put a stone in front of it, a stone that was so large that not even 20 men could even budge it. It would have been remarkable for Jesus to have survived all the beatings that he had taken. It would have been remarkable that he would have survived the actual crucifixion, then put into wrapped around linen, placed in the tube, and then all of a sudden kind of come conscious, and then have enough strength to get up and go to that stone that is immovable and kind of push it over and walk out. Some might say, you know what, the disciples stole the body. Yeah, because, because they wanted to prove that this was the Son of God, and so they, 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 they rolled the stone at night when nobody was looking. Well, the reality is the gospel account is this. Because the Roman officials were so concerned that the tomb would be tampered with, they put soldiers security outside of the tomb to ensure that nobody would touch it. They actually sealed the tomb so that you can tell if it was tampered with. Friends, the fact of the matter is this. Jesus said he would die and after three days rise again, and that is exactly what he did. Though many make predictions that never come true, but when Jesus predicts something, it happens. Now, not only did Jesus predict his resurrection, but Jesus proved his resurrection. Jesus proved he had resurrected by appearing to several individuals and groups of people. The way you really know for sure is oh, an empty tomb doesn't, doesn't do it. Where's the body? Where is he? The fact is Jesus revealed himself over and over again to individuals and groups of people post-resurrection to prove that his resurrection actually happened. He shows up to Mary Magdalene in Mark 16, 9. He shows up to women returning from the tomb in Matthew 28. He shows up to Peter later in that day, Luke 24, 34. He shows up to the disciples on the road of Emmaus, Luke 24. He shows up to the apostles that were gathering in a house. Thomas wasn't there, but the others were there. He revealed himself to them. Then he shows up again to the apostles, only with Thomas this time around in John 20. Thomas was a doubter. He didn't buy it. He, was, he, he thought intellectually this doesn't work. And so Jesus revealed himself to him. He even made him touch his hands that were nail scarred. He then shows up to a multitude of 500 plus people on a Galilean mountain in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. He shows up to James, his brother, as illustrated in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. All in all, he showed up 15 times post-resurrection. Resurrection, because not only did he predict his resurrection, but he proved it by appearing to many post-resurrection. Now, a gentleman by the name of Sir Lionel Lutko, one of the most successful lawyers who succeeded in getting his 244th consecutive murder acquitt acquittal by January 1, 1985. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records. 245 acquittals of murder. This is the best of the best lawyers. Well, Lionel was intrigued with this story of Jesus. And so he began to forensically study the case of Christ, the case of his resurrection. And he went through all the data and all the facts as a good lawyer would. After much research on the resurrection of Jesus, he concluded by saying this. 
I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. One of the most successful lawyers looking at the evidence. You see, Jesus, not only did he predict that he would die and three days later arise from the dead, but he actually revealed himself. He actually proved his resurrection by appearing over 15 times, including a group of 500 on a mountainside. The fact of the matter is Jesus still continues to prove his resurrection. He still continues to prove his resurrection. You might ask this morning, how does he do that? Because he's still transforming people's lives. The fact of the matter is if we all had an opportunity to share of our encounters with God and the power of God and what he has done in us, in us, it is evidence that God is alive and well, that our Jesus is not in behind a stone somewhere, but he is a Jesus who is alive, living and active in people's lives around the world. Scholar John Stott said this, the transformation of the disciples of Jesus is the greatest evidence of all for the resurrection. You see, these, these disciples, they, they weren't the most bold and courageous people. Before Jesus died, many denied him. They scattered and abandoned him. They didn't want to be caught with him in the line of fire. Doesn't sound like very courageous men and women. But post-resurrection, something happens in them. Because they are clearly confident that this Jesus was not just an ordinary man, not just a good moral teacher, not just like any other rabbi, but this was truly the Son of God, so much so that their lives began to change because they had met with the resurrected Jesus. You know, some say the disciples made up all these hallucinations that they saw Jesus on the road post-resurrection and so on. The reality is, friends, these disciples ended up being martyred for their faith. They ended up dying for the name and the cause of Christ. Who in their right mind would die for a lie? They had seen Jesus. There was no doubt. And that resurrection power came into their lives and transformed them to the point of them willing to give up their lives for the sake of Christ. Simon Greenleaf, a Harvard attorney, says of the disciples, it was therefore impossible that they could have persisted in affirming the truth they had narrated had not Jesus actually risen from the dead. And had they not known this fact as certainty as they knew any other if you look at some of these disciples and how their lives changed, let's take James, for instance, the brother of Jesus. Post or prior to the resurrection, before the resurrection, in many ways, James despised all his brother stood for. He thought Christ's claims were blatant and served only to ruin the family name. But after the resurrection, though James is found with all the other disciples preaching the gospel of the Lord, in fact, there's an epistle in the Bible near the end of your Bible. It's entitled James. He wrote it. And in James chapter 1, verse 1, he describes this new relationship that he had with Christ. He describes himself as a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am tied to you, Jesus. You are my king. Something happened in James. And we get a hint as to what happened in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. The only explanation for this change in James's life is that which Paul gives us when he says, after that, Jesus was seen by James. James met with the resurrected Jesus, and all of a sudden, his life was transformed. How about Thomas? Doubting Thomas, intellectual Thomas. He wasn't buying this thing. Resurrection? No. Thomas had given up all intellectual belief. He saw no chance for Jesus. He did not believe in his physical power. He had made up his mind that the forces of this outer world would be too strong for Jesus. However, 
Jesus made himself known to Thomas as well. The result of Jesus walking into his life post-resurrection, we find it in John's gospel when Thomas, when he meets with Jesus after he's resurrected from the dead, he says, my Lord, my God. James, Thomas, they had life-transforming experiences because they met with the resurrection See, Thomas had a transformational encounter with Christ. He went on to die a martyr's death because he met with a resurrected Jesus. Jesus has continued to prove his resurrection through 2,000 years of history by continuing to transform people's lives today. Like I said earlier, some of you are sitting here and your marriage was just in pieces, but God walked into your marriage and restored it and reconciled it. Some of you have had ailments and physical challenges, and, and you have stories of how God showed up and touched your body. Some of you have stories of, of, of how you were in addictions, and God showed up, and you met the resurrected Jesus, and he broke those addictions in your life. Some of you have stories where you were so far from God, and then in the darkness, in your quiet spot, God revealed himself to you. Some of you have seen your family members completely transformed. Something has happened that is so beyond human. It's supernatural. And the reality is, it is proof that there is a resurrected Jesus. He no longer sits in a tomb with a stone in front of him, but he has been resurrected indeed. Every religious leader of all the religion, main religions, their leaders, you'll find their graves with their remains. But with Jesus... You will not find his remains because he predicted he would die and arise from the dead. And three days, he, he did just that. He followed through with his prediction. In fact, he proved his resurrection over and over again by revealing himself post-resurrection. Friend, today on this Resurrection Sunday, Jesus wants to touch your life today once again to prove to you that he is not a dead God but he is a living God. Now, there are some amazing benefits to this resurrection. Oh, the eternal benefits of the resurrection are massive, and they're for you, and they're for me today. In fact, many of them are listed in 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 to 9. Now, this is Peter. Remember Peter? He's the one who denied Jesus in the darkest moments of Christ's life didn't have so much power, didn't have so much success, did he? But now, post-resurrection, Peter is a different man. His life has been transformed, and he writes of the benefits of the resurrection, and I read it to you. And let these words just wave into your life today on Easter Sunday. It says this, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Into what? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, it can never spoil, it will never fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer some grief in all kinds of different trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than any gold, which perishes even through refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so Peter, he outlines some of the benefits. Benefit number one, he says you have a hope because of the resurrection. Hope is the expectation of a better tomorrow. Hope is what gets us through the difficult times of our life. When we believe in Jesus and his resurrection, God gives us the benefit of a living hope, promising that the best days are ahead of you. Friend, because of the resurrection, the best days are 
ahead of you. The living hope enables us to persevere even though we go through trials. Benefit number two, Peter uh, writes it. He says, you have an inheritance. When we believe in Jesus, we become the daughters and sons of God. God himself guarantees our eternal inheritance and promises that it can never perish, it can never spoil, and it will never fade. You might sit here and say, man, I don't have such an affluent family. I don't come from a family that, that loves God. I, I, it, listen, friend, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the greatest inheritance ever known to mankind, and it is the kind of inheritance that does not perish, that does not spoil, and that does not fade. Because of the resurrection of Jesus. Benefit number three is heaven. The wonder of living with God for eternity in a place where God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. For the old order of things have passed away. We can say that with confidence today because our resurrected Jesus is alive and well, and you and I have a heaven that is waiting for us and our loved ones if we say yes to Jesus. Benefit number four to this resurrection is joy. Happiness is about immediate circumstances. Joy is so much deeper than that. Joy comes from the belief that God is in charge, and he'll make everything turn out right in the end. We believe that the God, listen to this, we believe that the God who brought Jesus through crucifixion to resurrection is the God who can get us through today's problems into tomorrow's victories. Do you believe that? The same God who brought Jesus through crucifixion right onto his resurrection will bring you through your darkest hours onto the other side because of the resurrection. Benefit number five to this resurrection is faith. Faith is like muscle. The more faith is exercised, the stronger it grows. When God allows us to stretch and grow our faith through current and difficult circumstances, I get it. Sometimes life is absolutely tragic and difficult. But faith in those moments begins to grow. It's not to take us down, but to make us stronger. We use those faith muscles when we walk through those difficulties in our life, when we believe in the resurrection, we believe that there's a better day and a better tomorrow because of the living hope that we have. And finally, benefit number six to the resurrection is salvation. Peter concludes his list by saying that the salvation of your souls is the biggest goal. God sent his son to, to save us. The benefits are great, but salvation from sin forever is the goal. Friend, today you can encounter this resurrection power, and he can save you and I from our sin. Jesus said these words. He said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. He said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. It means that death has no power to take you from the arms of the Father. Guilt cannot separate you from God. Whatever bad news you face, if you have crossed that line, if you have trusted in Jesus, you have a resurrection coming. So to the elderly person whose health is frail, almost gone, you don't have to live in fear. You have a resurrection coming. To the devastated wife whose husband has just left you, you feel betrayed and alone. You don't have to live defeated, friend. You have a resurrection coming. To the frightened parents of a depressed child, you don't have to live burdened by this weight of blame. You have a resurrection coming. To the anxious worker who has lost their job, you have a resurrection coming. To the lonely young person longing to be loved, you have a resurrection coming. Whoever you are, if you have taken the all-important step of faith, you are, not living in a, you are now living in a new reality. The Father's arms are plenty strong for you. They have not lost any of their power, and they will pick you up. Why? Because resurrection is coming. Friend, it is amazing to me how so many folks just are fearful of death. They're fearful of it. In fact, 
came across an interesting article. We still can't stop the brute fact of death, but that isn't stopping five billionaires who are trying to lead the human race out of mortality. First, there's billionaire Peter Thiel, who has invested heavily in organizations like the SEND Foundation, which is devoted in developing rejuvenation biotechnologies, although nothing's panned out as of yet. Then there's William Andrag, the founder of Silicon Valley nanotechnology startup called Halcyon Molecular, who claims that he plans to live for millions, billions, and hundreds of billions of years. Halcyon Molecular quietly went out of business last summer. Then there's Russian transhumanist multimillionaire Dmitry Itzkov, who launched the 2045 initiative, and he offers the promise that humans be immortal by the year 2045, just as soon as we make a leap into artificial machine bodies. But the billionaire who brings the most fiery passion to the cause by far is Larry Ellison, who gives out more than $40 million to the Ellison Medical Foundation to understand lifespan development process. According to Forbes magazine, Ellison's net worth is $43 billion. And Ellison said, death makes me very angry. It doesn't make any sense to me. Death has never made any sense to me. How can a person be there and then just vanish? Just not be there anymore. Oh, friends, can you say that? If you believe in Jesus and you put your faith in Christ, you have the hope of eternity. Life doesn't end. Remember the words of Jesus, whoever believes and lives in me will never die. I wish I could tell Mr. Ellison these words. You do not need to fear death any longer. Our life is like a vapor in the air. It's here a moment, gone the next. And that next moment, you will be in the very presence of God and never again need to deal with sorrow, never again need to battle with sin. Oh, Mr. Ellison, would you not come to Jesus today? Would you say yes to Jesus so that your life is in the hands of a father who dearly loves you? No need to fear death, no need to fight death. The fact of the matter is, the power of Christ's resurrection, there is no other power like it. No power of positive thinking could even come close. No karma belief can even come close. No education can even come close. I conclude with this as the team comes up. A minister was in Italy, and there he saw the grave of a man who had died centuries before, who was a non-believer. He didn't believe in Jesus. In fact, he was completely against Christianity. So the man had a huge stone slab put over his grave. Get this, true story. Put a huge stone slab over his grave so he would not have to be raised from the dead in case there is a resurrection from the dead. He had insignias put all over the slab saying, I do not want to be raised from the dead. I don't believe in it. Evidently, when he was buried, an acorn must have fallen into the grave. So a hundred years later, that acorn had grown up through the grave and split that slab in two. It was now a tall, towering oak tree. The minister looked at it and asked, if an acorn which has power of biological life in it can split a slab of that magnitude, what can the acorn of God's resurrection do in a person's life? You see, the minute you decide to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. It's the power of the resurrection, the same thing that raised Jesus from the dead. Think of the things you see as immovable slabs in your life. Just think of those things that seem immovable, insurmountable. There's no way out of this. Maybe it's your bitterness. Maybe it's your insecurity. Maybe it's fears. Maybe it's your self-doubts. Maybe it's your addictions. 
those things can be split and rolled off. The more you know Christ, the more you grow in the power of the resurrection. Question is, friends, do you believe? Do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe in the Son of God? This song is going to be yours and my opportunity to say, Jesus, today I'm putting a line in the sand. I got some doubts. I'm kind of like Thomas sometimes. I got these challenges. I got these stones. I got these addictions. I got these, this story that's riddled with pain. Yeah, I got all that stuff. Bring it to Jesus because his power is so massive that it will revolutionize and transform your life just like it did James, just like it did Peter, just like it did those women who saw the empty tomb. And so this song says, I believe in you. I believe you rose again. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in life eternal. I believe in that virgin birth, and I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Okay, so friends, I believe in the resurrection. That means I believe he is more than able to break through in your situation. He's more than able to give you enough strength to endure your challenge and your difficulty. And so would you stand with us for this, this morning, on this Easter Sunday? Whatever it is, maybe it's a family dynamic, whatever it is, you just begin. Use your mouth and begin to profess, I believe in a resurrected Jesus. And in this most holy moment, on this Easter Sunday, I believe the resurrected Jesus will visit you.